It's my pleasure to introduce Joe Lykin. Joe is a Fermilab scientist and the head of the Fermilab Quantum Institute. He got his PhD from MIT and joined Fermilab in 1989, where he has worked on various topics in particle theory, including string theory, neutrinos, and the possibility of detecting extra dimensions of space. For eight years, from 2014 to through 2022, he was Fermilab's deputy director. Tonight, he is going to talk to us about wormholes, a topic that has gotten a lot of recent attention as a way of thinking about the mysterious connections between quantum physics and gravity. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Joe Lykin. So let me... Uh... First of all, congratulate this audience, because you are a brave audience. We are going to tonight be holding hands and jumping into the wormhole, and we're going to see what happens when we do that. But before we do that, I want to give you sort of a preview of what's coming, because it's kind of a complicated story in a way. So I want to give you the whole story up front, and then I'm going to go back and, and give it to you in a little more detail. So let's start with a little preview of my story. So in recent years, I'll give you a little timeline. There's been a serious series of results that have established what I would say is a promising pathway towards both exhibiting and exploring effects of quantum gravity in the laboratory. And I'll explain what I mean by that, I hope. This pathway exploits what seems to be a fundamental relationship between the fabric of space, so we'll talk a little bit about fabric of space, and something called quantum entanglement, which I will try to explain, although it's difficult to explain. And this relationship is realized in a phenomenon called wormholes. In fact, these are what we call traversable wormholes, which just means wormholes that, in principle, you can travel through, or something you can travel through. And at least in some cases, these traversal wormholes, I'll argue, have an equivalent description in terms of a new form of something, some other weird thing called quantum teleportation. I'll try to explain what, what that is. And this equivalence between wormholes and, and quantum teleportation, as will become clear, is known as ER equals EPR. And I'll give you a hint, the E in both cases stands for Einstein. And this new kind of quantum teleportation that I claim is related to wormholes is really interesting because it can be performed, uh, at least in principle, on a quantum computer. So if that's true, and I'll show you that it is true, then that means we can create and observe the dynamics of wormholes, these very exotic objects, in a laboratory experiment. And in fact, we recently performed the first successful experiment of this type on a Google Sycamore quantum computer. I'll show you the results. And the reason I think this is exciting, it's, it's interesting that we can do it at all, but the reason I think it's really exciting is I think it opens the door to more ambitious experiments that can directly address what I think is one of the most important and confusing questions of fundamental physics, which is how the fabric of space emerges. Where does space actually come from? And I'm going to try to answer that partly uh, in the language of quantum entanglement. So that's where we're going. And uh, I think a good place to, to start with that is for me to spend a few minutes explaining to you why quantum gravity is hard to understand. I'm sure you believe me that it's hard to understand, but I want to give you a little more information about why that is. So first of all, I already mentioned something that sounds like a really important basic question, but also a difficult and confusing question, which is what is the fabric of space? So we already know from Einstein many years ago told us that gravity is curvature in the fabric of space-time. And you see these sorts of pictures all over the place trying to explain what Einstein was trying to tell us. And this is a statement about classical physics that you can think of gravity as the curvature in the fabric of space. But you can ask, well, what is the fabric itself that's being curved? And another way of saying that that's a little more concrete is what is the space, what is space from the quantum point of view? Because we think that quantum mechanics is the more fundamental description of the world. Uh, beyond classical physics. So that's a hard question. And in quantum theory, if you, if you ask uh, experts, uh, well, what's actually happening? What does quantum theory say about space? They will usually wave their hands and start talking about something called space-time foam. And this is the idea that if you could look at space at very, very, very short distances, you would eventually see that it's not smooth, 
In fact, it's not even curved, that it's actually some sort of jagged, more, more quantum that's uh, not only is kind of wiggly because of Berg's uncertainty principle. It's this uh, wiggly thing that we call space-time foam, but that's just a name. Everything about space-time foam, or even if there really is space-time foam. And the other thing that's difficult about this is that even if there is space-time foam, uh, the, the microscope you would need to see it uh, would have to resolve distances as small as something we call the Planck length. And that microscope, which would really have to be a particle accelerator, uh, has to resolve distances that are 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, which is such a short distance that it's never going to happen. So that's a problem. So we, of course, try to do experiments with gravity, and you can try to do experiments that look at quantum properties of gravity. And of course, we're trying to do that, and we're thinking about that at Fermilab, what are ways you can do that. But the problem is that gravity is very, very weak on scales where you can do experiments. Uh, for example, the electromagnetic repulsion between two protons, just as an example, is 10 to the 40th times stronger than their gravitational attraction to each other. So that, that makes it much harder to study gravity in the laboratory than it is to study the other forces of nature, which of course we have done at Fermilab and other places. It doesn't seem so obvious to us in our regular life that gravity is weak because of course we're sitting on the earth and the earth is a huge source of gravity. And also these electromagnetic effects that in principle are much stronger are also mostly screened or neutralized in, in real life. But as an example, you can notice that a tiny magnet all by itself can exert a more powerful repulsion in order to give you this levitation, uh, overcoming the entire attractive force of, of, from gravity of the entire Earth. So it's pretty clear that gravity is very weak. So almost all the progress we've made in quantum gravity in the last 50 years or so, people have been thinking about it, has come from what I would call theoretical laboratories rather than real laboratory experiments. And those two theoretical laboratories were, first of all, thinking about black holes, which we've been doing for more than 50 years now, uh, we've actually learned a lot about black holes just by thinking about them, because a black hole is a well-defined thing that you can think about. And we've even established, I would say, uh, some quantum properties of black holes. For example, the existence of Hawking radiation. We think that black holes actually give off uh, Hawking radiation and, and lose energy and shrink as a result of that. And in fact, black holes may eventually evaporate entirely due to emitting Hawking radiation. And that's a quantum effect. That's quantum gravity when I say that. And nowadays, we actually are able to get images, at least of the shadows of black holes, like this, this image of the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And we get detailed data from LIGO, which observe gravity waves, which are actual ripples in space-time produced by black holes that are merging with each other. So black holes are becoming an experimental science. And then the other theoretical laboratory that's been very useful is, is something called string theory. And I'm not really going to talk about string theory tonight. But string theory is at least a mathematically consistent way to talk about quantum gravity. It may not be the way that nature does quantum gravity, but it's at least mathematically consistent. And that allows you to answer questions that are otherwise uh, kind of murky to answer with classical methods. All right, so now we're going to hold hands and jump into the wormhole. So let's start with ER and wormholes. So what's a wormhole? A wormhole is a kind of a shortcut through space. The term wormhole was introduced by physicist John Wheeler in the 1950s. I don't know why he thought that was a good name. It's kind of a dopey name. Uh, the first paper that describes wormholes was actually by Einstein and his assistant Rosen in 1935. And they didn't call them wormholes. They called them bridges, which is a more dignified name. But I think we're stuck with the uh, wormholes now. So in this paper in 1935, Einstein and Rosen talked about the first wormhole and their wormhole was actually a connection between two black holes. And they described this in general relativity, which, as I said, is a classical theory of gravity. And so you can think of their wormhole as, as a bridge or a connection between two different black holes. So if you're a physicist, you don't draw the picture that I showed you in the previous slide. You draw one of these fancier space-time diagrams. But it's, it's the same idea. The idea, the idea here is that on the left, you're outside of a black hole. And on the right, you're outside of another black hole. And then you can imagine doing an experiment where someone on the left black hole actually falls into it and eventually falls through the event horizon of the black hole and is in the interior region here that I've labeled Roman numeral two. And then maybe someone else on the other side and the other black hole also falls through that black hole and also gets into this region two. 
And then they can have a conversation. They can meet each other. They can shake hands. They can talk for a while for about a, it's usually about a millisecond or a microsecond uh, until they hit the singularity here and are destroyed. So that is a connection. It's a physical connection between the two black holes, but it's not really good for anything because you can't really get from one side to the other. So this is what we call a non-traversable wormhole. It's a physical connection between two things. It's got a, a, two entrances, but you can't actually go through. So people have thought about this at least since the 1980s, they have known that if you wanted to make a wormhole that was traversable, which this is not, you would have to do something else. You'd have to uh, give it some additional physical properties. And in fact, it's been known since the 1980s that the property that's missing here is that you need somehow to inject what's called negative energy into the wormhole, which from the classical point of view is kind of a weird thing because most energy is positive. So for example, Kip Thorne, who, who was in the 1980s and still is one of the world's great authorities on wormholes, he wrote this really nice description. This is a tongue in cheek paper that he wrote in the 1980s called Wormholes in Spacetime and Their Use in Interstellar Travel. And uh, it's a very, I rec highly recommend it. It's a very nice description of what was known about wormholes. And he says somewhere in there, one could imagine an exceedingly advanced civilization pulling a wormhole out of this sub-microscopic quantum mechanical space-time foam. So he already knew in the 1980s that if you really wanted to make a wormhole that uh, Jodie Foster could jump into and go to travel to meet her father somewhere, as happens in the movie Contact here, uh, you would have to use a quantum effect. You would have to add a quantum effect that somehow is getting this negative energy into the, into the wormhole in order to make it traversable. So this has been known for a long time that in principle, uh, traversable wormholes could be done this way, but nobody had uh, a concrete way of looking at it uh, that anybody would believe. Uh, here you see Kip on the left with Jessica Chastain in another sci-fi movie, Interstellar, checking the equations of the wormholes or something. So let me get back to the negative energy. So why do I say that negative energy is a quantum effect? This is something that was already figured out by Stephen Hawking in his original papers on black holes. And here he was not interested in wormholes. He was interested in Hawking radiation coming from black holes. And he said, there's a problem here because I claim that black holes give off Hawking radiation. The Hawking radiation goes off to infinity, carries away energy. So that means that the black hole should shrink. So that's interesting. And this is a quantum effect because Hawking radiation is a quantum effect. So how does that actually happen? Because uh, that means that something is making the black hole shrink, but positive energy or positive mass going into black holes makes black holes bigger. That's how you get things like the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. It's by ordinary stuff falling into them. So the only way to make a black hole shrink instead of expand is if you have negative energy moving into the black hole. So Hawking said, whatever is this quantum process that produces Hawking radiation, it must also produce negative energy that falls into the black hole and makes the black hole shrink, makes the horizon shrink. So that was negative energy as applied to black holes. And it turns out you can use the same kind of idea in order to make wormholes traversable. But this was not understood until very recently, until 2016, by uh, my collaborator, Daniel Jafferis and, and his collaborators. These are string theorists, and they use string theory in order to do a, a real calculation where you can believe the answer because they're using a consistent description of quantum gravity to show how to make traversable wormholes. So we now know that traversable wormholes are possible in principle. So what was the missing effect? I said the missing effect, it had to be a quantum effect, and it had to somehow get negative energy into this description of the wormhole. And they showed you can actually do this very simply, but what you need to do is in addition to having your wormhole uh, that's connecting to systems like two black holes, you also have to set, have some additional direct interaction uh, between the two entrances of the wormhole. So that's the dashed line in this picture that I've shown you. And once you do that in the right way, and they showed a simple examples of how to do this, that can have this effect of injecting negative energy through, through quantum effects into the wormhole and actually opening up a pathway, which is this black line with the arrow here, where you jump in, let's say from the left side into the wormhole, you get into the interior of the wormhole, you think, uh oh, I'm in trouble because I can't get out because I'm the wrong side of the horizon of a black hole, that's this orange line here. But then the negative energy pulse that you also sent in uh, moves the horizon of the, the black hole just so that you can escape. 
So that's the idea of traversable wormholes. It's a quantum effect and it requires negative energy. And the other thing you notice about this is that this connection between the two ends of the, of the wormhole is only there for some period of time and this only works for some period of time. So you can think about this traversable wormhole as a door that opens, but then it closes. It's all, it's, so if you go too soon, you won't make it through. And if you go too late, you also won't make it through. The other interesting thing about this is that to connect the two ends of the uh, wormhole, that's something you have to do in ordinary space and it requires ordinary physics. So that's something that you certainly can't do faster than the speed of light. And this simple fact about traversable wormholes is telling you something important that people had wondered about for a long time, which is whether I could make something with wormholes that looks like faster than light travel or faster than light communication or even time machines made out of wormholes. And uh, what these, this result from the string theorist shows you is that none of that stuff is possible, that the wormholes that they're talking about uh, can't be used for, for anything that would look that exotic. Although it's true that if you jump into the wormhole yourself, you may find that you get to the other side in a very short period of time. But somebody watching you from, from outside will say that you didn't go faster than the speed of light. So that's an introduction into wormholes. And now I'm going to talk about something for a few minutes that seems to have absolutely nothing to do with what I was talking about before. And that's the EPR part of this and quantum teleportation. And here's actually a quantum teleportation lab, one of the quantum teleportation labs that we have at Fermilab, where we actually do this kind of stuff. So this uh, part of the story goes back to another paper in 1935, also by Einstein and Rosen. This time they had a third co collaborator named Podolsky. And they were looking at a completely different, what seems to be a completely different phenomenon, which is what they called the paradox of quantum entanglement. And I'm gonna spend a few minutes trying to explain what it was that they were worried about. And in order to do that, I'm gonna have to talk about the difference between classical information and quantum information. So classical information we're all familiar with uh, in, in modern society. It's, this is just the statement that any classical information of any kind could be encoded in terms of binary data, which just means strings of zeros and ones. So we say the basic unit of classical data is the bit, and the bit can take two values, zero or one, and you can reduce, reduce everything to bits. So the collected works of William Shakespeare can be encoded in 16,800,000 bits, if I count it correctly. Quantum information, on the other hand, is encoded in qubits. So what's a qubit? Well, any quantum physical system, it has a certain number of physical states that it can be in, depending on what the system is. And so I look at a system like that, and I pick out two of those quantum states that it can be in, and I label them zero and one. And here I'm gonna use these funny little brackets to remind you that when I talk about qubits, zero and one are not just numbers, they're referring to actual physical states of, of some system. Then one of the peculiar properties of quantum mechanics is that it tells you that, well, if it can be in the state zero and it can be in the state one, it can also be in what we call a quantum superposition of zero and one. And in fact, there's an infinite number of different quantum superpositions that it can be in. And I've only shown one of them here, which is a completely even balance superposition where it's uh, sort of half and half uh, zero and one. And this may not be familiar to you in sort of mathematical language, but you probably heard of the paradox of Schrodinger's cat, which is an example of trying to do a superposition of a cat that's uh, alive and dead simultaneously. So that's already kind of strange. This, of course, means that a qubit is a much more general kind of a beast than a classical bit that we're familiar with. And this is a problem when you try to measure qubits in the laboratory, because quantum, quantum information there's sort of more quantum information in a unit than there is classical information. And that means when you measure it and you turn it into zeros and ones, because that's what classical information is, uh, how, do you, how do you keep all the information? And the way quantum mechanics solves this problem is it tells you, well, if you measure a quantum state uh, that's in a superposition, you'll get either zero or one. So the answer is a classical bit, but there's some probability for which, whether you get a zero or whether you get a one. So if you like, the measurement is converting the quantum information into probabilities. And this is a feature of quantum mechanics that you can't get around. And it's one of the features of quantum mechanics that Einstein uh, did not like. He was not pleased with at all. But that's not actually what he's complaining about in this paper. He's complaining about quantum entanglement, which is an even stranger property than quantum superposition, as I'll explain to you. 
And this refers to the possibility of two or more qubits sharing their quantum information. And I'll give you an example of that in a minute. If you want uh, more details to trying to explain quantum entanglement, our own superstar, Don Lincoln, has a whole video, YouTube video you can find on this, uh, explaining this in much more detail. And I'll also remind you that the Nobel Prize in Physics last year uh, went to three uh, gentlemen who had done experiments that are showing effects of quantum entanglement. So this is, entanglement's a big deal. So here's an example of something that's not entanglement. Suppose I have two qubits and I give one to Alice and the other one belongs to Bob. And they're both in these superposition states that I talked about, these simple ones. So it's it's not in the state zero, it's not in the state one, it's a superposition of zero, one. We'll suppose Alice's is, is one is like that and Bob's one is like that. And then what do they do? Well, they go out and measure their qubits because that's all you can do with the qubits. So if Alice measures her qubit, there's a 50% chance she'll get the result zero and 50% chance she'll get one. And the same for Bob, he measures his qubit, there's a 50% chance he'll get zero and 50% one. And there's, and there's no way to predict the result. You just do the measurement and something happens. Uh, and in this case, Bob's result doesn't depend in any way on Alice's result. There are two different qubits or two different measurements. They have nothing to do with each other. And in this case, we say that Alice and Bob's qubits are not entangled. So this is an example of not being entangled. But now there's something else I could do if I've got two qubits. I could combine Alice and Bob's qubits into th this state here. So this state here that I've written down, what this means is that it's a superposition, like I was talking about before, but now it's a superposition of either both Alice and Bob's qubits being in the zero state or both Alice and Bob's qubits being in a one state. So what happens when they do the measurement now? Well, it's still true that if Alice measures her qubit, there's a 50% chance she'll get zero. And it's still true that if Bob measures his qubit, there's a 50% chance he will get zero. So it sounds the same so far. But if Alice measures zero, there's a 100% chance that Bob will also measure zero. And that's kind of obvious from the fact that the way I've constructed this thing, it looks like Alice's qubit and Bob's qubit are really sharing one qubit's worth of quantum information. And that's, in fact, exactly what they're doing. So even though there's randomness, even though you can't predict the outcome of the measurement, there's no way of predicting the outcome of in the individual measurements. They're 100% correlated because they're really sharing the same quantum information. And this property of sharing quantum information like this is called quantum entanglement. And in fact, the example I've shown you, you here is an example where two qubits are maximally entangled because they're two qubits that act like they were one qubit. This is the thing that Einstein was complaining about. He was very, very unhappy with this. In fact, this uh, particular maximally entangled state of two qubits I've shown you here is known as an EPR pair in, in honor of, of these folks and, and their being the first people to complain about this. So they point out in their paper that it's not only that this seems strange that you should be able to do this, but they also pointed out that the property of entanglement doesn't make any reference to how far apart Alice and Bob are when they make their measurements, they have to come out the same. So after I produce these two entangled qubits, Alice could be in London and Bob can be in Minnesota, but nevertheless, uh, their measurements are gonna be 100% correlated when they do them. Or they could be, Alice could be here on earth and Bob could be in the Andromeda galaxy. It doesn't matter. Quantum entanglement doesn't care about the spatial location of the two entangled qubits. It just doesn't care. And this is what Einstein was super unhappy about in this paper. He complained about it. He said, there's either something wrong with quantum mechanics or there's something missing in quantum mechanics. And he called it uh, this uh, these German words that I can't uh, pronounce, but the translation of them is something like a spooky or ghostly action at a distance. He just found it unacceptable. Well, that's bad enough, but now I'm gonna go on and describe something even stranger than that that wasn't known in Einstein's day, but it's something that we actually do now, as I already indicated, and that's quantum teleportation. So this is a way of sending quantum information using this property of entanglement. So now I'm gonna uh, assume that Alice and Bob are already sharing two qubits of an entangled state, like the one that I showed you before. And now Alice has another qubit, I'll call that the message qubit, it's in some quantum state. And she wants to send her quantum state her quant or the quantum information in that state to Bob. So she can do that pretty simply. Nowadays, we know the recipe for this. It's a simple way to do that. It involves three steps that I won't give you the details, but just sort of the flavor of it. 
So the first step is that Alice does something quantum to her two qubits, and we, we know what this is, but I won't go into the details. And after she does that something, she makes a measurement of her two qubits. Then she does something that isn't quantum, it's totally classical. She calls Bob on the phone and she says, hey, Bob, this was the result of the measurement that I just did. Bob then does something else quantum to his qubit. And if everybody does the thing that they were supposed to do, the net result of this is you are now guaranteed that whatever it was that was in Alice's qubit, her message qubit, is now in the possession of Bob. So we call this sending quantum information. It's, it's really uh, teleportation in the sense of sending the quantum state because uh, once this is we are done, uh, Alice's message qubit doesn't is in a different state. It's not in the same state we started with, but Bob's state is now in the state that the message qubit was in. So whatever it was that Alice originally had, she doesn't have it anymore, and Bob does ha have it, and that's why we call this teleportation. Uh, this process of quantum teleportation, as far as quantum entanglement is concerned, doesn't care if Alice is in the Andromeda galaxy and Bob is on Earth, or where, it doesn't care where they are. But there is one step in quantum teleportation that does care where they are, and that's the phone call. So strangely enough, the phone call is the only part of quantum teleportation that keeps you from doing something here that's faster than light communication. So it's not faster than light communication, because even though the quantum entanglement doesn't care how far away they are, the phone call step does. And you can't do a phone call faster than light. So this all sounds very strange. And as I said, Einstein thought it was nutty. But it is for real, and we can do quantum teleportation. It's been performed in the laboratory many times so over decades now. And in fact, we're using this to develop what's, what's going to be the quantum internet. The Department of Energy that funds us says they want to build a quantum internet. So that would be a, a quantum teleportation network that would eventually link everybody in the world. And as a, getting a start on this, because this is technically very difficult, obviously, uh, we were funded by a branch of DOE, Advanced Scientific Computing, to actually start doing this over the uh, distances of the, the size of the city of Chicago. So this is a collaboration between Fermilab, Argonne Lab, Northwestern University, and Caltech. And we have already built uh, at Fermilab two of these quantum teleportation nodes. And we're going to be connecting to Argonne soon and then connecting to downtown Chicago. And this will actually be a real quantum teleportation network, network that you can use, for example, to connect two quantum computers together. So this is for real. Quantum teleportation for, is for real, and it's going to be used for, for many things in the future. Furthermore, you can do quantum teleportation in the laboratory on a quantum computer, and that's the kind of quantum teleportation I'll be uh, interested in for the rest of this presentation. So for example, Google Sycamore is, is a quantum computer. And you can actually perform a circuit uh, on that quantum computer that does quantum teleportation at short range. And it's, it's, uh, it, it's, this is the simple example of the same type that I was talking about with Alice and Bob. OK, so now part three. I talked about two things that seem to have nothing to do with each other. And now, what do they have to do with each other? So this is the ER equals EPR hypothesis. So two string theorists, Juan Maldacena and Lenny Suskind, in 2013, argued in a famous, now famous paper that the ER paper on wormholes from 1935 and the other Einstein paper on entanglement in 1935 are actually talking about the same thing. So that seems kind of crazy, but they had detailed arguments for why this is reasonable. But it is a hypothesis. They pointed out in their paper that the Einstein-Rosen bridge actually occurs because the two black holes are entangled. They are, it's the quantum entanglement that produces the wormhole behavior in the Einstein-Rosen bridge to begin with. And in fact, they said more generally, you can think of wormholes in general as the result of entanglement between different kinds of quantum systems. So it doesn't have to be two black holes that are entangled, but it has to be two kinds of quantum systems that through quantum entanglement will start to look like wormholes. And more specifically, this hypothesis, if it's correct, means that traversable wormholes, the kind you can go through, always have an equivalent physical description as some form of quantum teleportation. So traversable wormhole equals some form of quantum teleportation. That's the claim. So in terms of diagrams, the, the nice picture that I showed you where I, I go in one side of the wormhole and I eventually come out the other side, and there's this extra dash line interaction that's like the negative energy pulse. 
All of that can be translated into statements about quantum teleportation, for example, in a quantum circuit on a quantum computer. It's gonna be more complicated teleportation than when I showed you before, because it has to at least somewhat look like what I was talking about with entangling two black holes. And so we call this mini body teleportation because the two systems that you're going to entangle and connect in order to get wormhole behavior have to be more complicated. But still, it's uh, essentially a mapping into some kind of quantum teleportation. The other strange thing about this is that when you have a physical system that is more than one equivalent physical description, we call this a duality. And dualities actually occur in physics all the time. Uh, the standard model of particle physics, for example, has dualities. There can be more than one equivalent way of describing the same thing. So that we're, we're kind of familiar with, at least in particle physics. But even for people that are familiar with dualities, this is what we call a holographic duality. Because in one description of this, we're doing quantum teleportation, and there's no wormhole. And in the other description, which is just as good, we're actually sending things through a wormhole. But sending things through a wormhole means there's some spatial direction that you actually send things through. That's the wormhole. And that means there's an extra spatial dimension in that description that wasn't in the other description in terms of quantum teleportation. So we call that holographic because there's one description, another description, they're equivalent but they have different number of dimensions. And if you've ever played around with holograms, uh, you know how, how this works in principle for holograms, where you have a 2D film and you record using a laser uh, something on the 2D film, it looks like nothing. It looks like speckles here, as you see on the right here. But from that, you're able to produce incredibly realistic 3D images. This is actually a holographic uh, projection using lots of tricks that I saw at the Brooklyn Museum over Christmas break. It's called The Disappearance of Lady Macbeth. And it just blows your mind because it, it looks like Lady Macbeth there in a room doing things. And you can walk around and look at it from all different sides. And it looks real, but there's nobody in that room. It's a holographic projection. So we know that in principle, this idea that you can have two different descriptions, one that's two-dimensional and one that's three-dimensional, for example, is possible. And that's the idea here with the wormholes. So this is very interesting from a number of points of view, because first of all, if this holographic duality from quantum teleportation is true, as, as uh, Maldesane and Suskind tell us, this gives us an opportunity to study directly how quantum entanglement weaves together to make new space. Because what I just told you was that in one description of this, it's quantum entanglement doing teleportation. And in the other description, it's wormholes that have this spatial dimension that I move through to get from one side of the wormhole to the other. So that's a statement about how quantum physics involving entanglement actually creates space by weaving something together. And that's exactly the thing we were interested in. So now, can we do any of this in the laboratory? Well, in principle, yes. Uh, I already showed you some pictures of equipment that actually do quantum teleportation. And I told you, you can do quantum teleportation uh, on quantum computers. So the idea now is to figure out a way, and we'll stick to quantum computers for now. The idea is to figure out a way to do this particular kind of what I was calling many body quantum teleportation on a quantum computer in such a way that when you do it and you look at it, you will see properties that look like moving something through a wormhole. That's the plan. So the first thing we have to figure out is uh, what are the things we're going to entangle because you can't entangle two black holes in the laboratory. That's a little too challenging. So I have to find something else that's not really a black hole, uh, but is sufficiently complicated that it might behave the same way and give me something that looks like a wormhole. And then I also have to figure out, having entangled two things, what's the extra interaction that I need that corresponds to the negative energy pulse that makes it traversable? So this now brings us to the paper uh, that we recently published in Nature. This came out November 30th. Uh, you, can, you can go read the paper. I just wanted to sh do a shout out here to the two co-first authors. So one is Daniel Jeffress, who I already mentioned from Harvard. He's a string theorist that showed that you can make traversable wormholes in the first place and actually wrote down the recipe for how to do this as a kind of quantum teleportation. And then the other person I wanted to shout out was Alex Locapa, who uh, is the person that actually did the experiment on the Google quantum computer. He embedded with the Google folks at Santa Barbara for quite a while until he learned how to use their quantum computer and they trusted him enough uh, 
to actually let him use it to do the experiment I'm going to describe. And let me point out that Alex was, in fact, an undergraduate student when he began this project. And if you want to learn more, there's, there's lots of places you can get more information about what's in this paper. So what are the two things that we're going to entangle? It's not two black holes. That's too hard. So we actually entangled two copies of something called the SYK model. And for those of you that know what a fermion is, the SYK model is a quantum mechanical model of, in, of N interacting Majorana fermions, where N is some number you specify. So it could be 10, 50, 1,000, whatever you think you can do. Um, and it turns out that interacting Majorana fermions uh, in quantum mechanics are really just the same thing as interacting qubits. So that's good because that means I, I can entangle two copies of this uh, quantum dynamics on a quantum computer uh, in principle without any trouble. So this was actually known for a long time. Now, the SYK model, one of its interesting features is that it doesn't care about where the qubits are in space. So this is already telling you that even if you exhibit something here that looks like a wormhole, the properties of that wormhole have nothing to do with the real space in your laboratory. It has nothing to do with space on the chip. It has nothing to do with space, real space in the laboratory, because the quantum dynamics, although the quantum dynamics are real dynamics, uh, they don't depend on real space in any uh, interesting way. So the good news about trying to do this is that it has already been shown by these uh, string theorists here that there's a certain mathematical limit that where, for example, this uh, N is very large, where the holographic duality that I'm talking about is actually present and you can show that the ER equals EPR hypothesis is true. So you might've been uh, afraid that maybe this whole idea from Maldesine and Suskind is just totally wrong. And then it's just pointless to even do the experiment because the idea is just wrong. But the idea is not, at least not totally wrong because there's at least a well-defined mathematical limit where you can show that it works. And the only question is whether it works in a real experiment. The bad news is we wanna do a real experiment. So that means we need to figure out, first of all, what N is. That was uh, the number of these Majorana fermions that I use uh, in my interactions. Um, if n is 50, for example, I need a quantum computer with at least 50 qubits, turns out. That's not a problem. Google Sycamore has more than 50 qubits, in fact. But the problem here is that the quantum circuit that you need to run on those 50 qubits would involve hundreds of millions of quantum gates. Think A quantum gate is, think of it as like a line of code in a regular computer program. And that's just ridiculously difficult. So that uh, maybe that will happen at some point in the future when quantum computers get super sophisticated and, and you have them on every street corner, but it's not going to happen for a long time. So in fact, if you look at the world's best quantum computers, and, and Google Sycamore is an example of the world's best quantum computer, uh, they actually can't execute meaningful quantum programs that have more than a few hundred of these quantum gate operations. So hundreds of millions, forget it. You have to get this down to a few hundred or you're doomed. So this uh, gave us some pause, and we thought about this for a really long time. It was actually Alex Lacapa, the student, that figured out a way around this. And the way around it is to use artificial intelligence methods. So artificial intelligence to the rescue here. And we did something that uh, we call learn sparsification to actually simplify these entangled models uh, whose quantum dynamics are supposed to produce wormhole-like features. And we had to simplify a lot because remember, we were starting with something that maybe had hundreds of millions of, of essentially lines of code, and we had to get that down to a couple hundred lines of code equivalent. So that's a lot of simplification. But we did manage to do this, and I won't go into the details of how we do it, but it's, uh, it's using what are now standard methods of, of artificial intelligence. There's a caveat here, which is that because we had to simplify this thing a, a lot in order to get it to run, we, we really are sort of pushing the ragged, hairy edge of, of something that can still behave like a wormhole. Uh, in fact, we've had uh, conversations with a couple of our colleagues who were skeptical about which side of the ragged, hairy edge we're actually on here. And you know, and that's a reasonable discussion to have because we really had to push this a lot to get it to work. And you know, that's, that's how science is. I think I described this to Dennis Overby as this, the simplest, crummiest uh, wormhole you can imagine because that's what it had to be in, in order to do an experiment on it. And in fact, I didn't even, I don't think I used the word crummiest, I used a different adjective, adjective, but he cleaned it up in the newspaper article. But that's what it is. 
However, because we simplified things so much, you could actually uh, simulate what we were trying to look at on the quantum computer. You could simulate it on a regular computer. So that's actually a big advantage because before we do the experiment on the Google quantum computer, we're able to look on a regular computer and see, does this thing look like it has the features of a wormhole? So in fact, we checked as many features as, as we could think of that have anything to do with wormholes to see if they were present in the system. So one feature I already told you is that traversable wormholes have this feature that there's a door that opens and then it closes. So you can get through, but if you go too early, it, it, it won't work. And if you go too late, it won't, it won't work. So in this diagram that I show you on the right here, this is a measure of that where think of the orange line as the probability that you're gonna get through. And then what you see is that at too early times, it's not likely that you'll get through. There's some time when it's most likely you will get through. And then at later times, it becomes again, less likely that you'll get through. So that's the door opening and the door closing, which is a feature of wormhole type teleportation. It's not a feature of ordinary ordinary quantum teleportation. I hesitate to use the word ordinary. Another feature that I already told you about was that the wormholes are traversable because you put in this negative energy pulse. So that's some interaction that we actually put into the quantum circuit. And you can say, well, what happens if I turned it into the equivalent of a positive energy pulse instead of a ne negative energy pulse? I shouldn't get the wormhole behavior anymore. So the, this nice orange peak should go away. And indeed it does. And you get this green line here, which is some other, some other kind of thing happening, but it's not the wormhole happening. So that's a good sign. And we checked several other features that are more technical, so I won't talk about them. Um, but as far as we can tell, in the regular computer simulation, this thing seemed to be working. So that's good. So that gave us the courage to say, well, let's try to, to run this on Google Sycamore. And the folks at Google were, were nice enough to give us access to the, their best computer, in fact. But it still wasn't obvious that this is gonna work because even the best quantum computers of today, they have noise. It's, it's a very sophisticated chip. It's a very sophisticated device, but it does have noise. It has imperfections. And so even if, it, if the simulation works on a classical computer, the worry would be that the noise in the chip is just gonna wash out all the wormhole behavior. That's why you have to do an experiment, see what happens. So here are, is actually a, uh, a measurement that Google has a standard way of measuring the, the error or the noise, if you like, uh, between any two qubits when you, we do these qubit gate operations. So here's the actual nine qubits that we used in the actual experiment. And here's the measurement using the way that Google measures the, the error when you apply two qubit gates that, that connect these two, uh, any two qubits together or adjacent qubits together. The circuit that we used uh, only used 164 of these two qubit gate operations. So that's a lot fewer than 100 million. So that's the only reason we can do this in the first place. And then the other thing you notice here on the right-hand side is that the error, every time you do one of these gate operations, the chance that you made an error is only a few parts in a thousand. So that's actually extremely good. This, that's, this is telling you that this is one of the best, if not the best quantum computer in the world, that it makes such a low error rate. But still, if you, do, if you make an error uh, a few times in a thousand and you do, do that 164 times, you might worry that you're gonna get garbage out the other end. So here's the result without any further ado, here's the result of the experiment. So we actually do the experiment many, many times. That's a feature of quantum mechanics. We did it 90,000 times and we get the results that you see here on the right. So the black dots are what happens when we have our two copies of the quantum dynamics and we don't connect them together with the negative energy pulse at all or any connection at all. So in that case, there shouldn't be any wormhole behavior and teleportation behavior. And you should see a flat line and that's what you see within errors. The gray dots are what we get by doing our simulation that you, the classical computer simulation you see on the left, and then actually adding in Google's own model for what the noise effects ought to be. So this is testing how well Google's noise model actually uh, compares to real data. And then the orange dots are the real data from the real experiment. And so you notice a couple of things. You notice that there's still an orange bump, so that's good. That's telling us that we're still getting the wormhole behavior. It's a lot worse because the noise makes everything a lot worse. And also the, what you would call the peak kind of got smushed into earlier times. And that's just because uh, when most of the time you fail due to noise, the noise accumulates over time. And so you're better uh, going through the door if you like earlier rather than later. And that, that sort of smushes this orange peak over to the left into earlier times. So that all makes sense. And we're very happy when you see this. And this is uh, 
This is an example of wormhole behavior on a real quantum computer. So just to remind you what this is and what it isn't. So we didn't drill a hole in ordinary space time on the chip or in the laboratory. Uh, so it's not Jody Foster's wormhole. On the other hand, it's not just a numerical computation. The, the classical computer simulation I showed you, that's just a computation. I just computed some formulas and I got some numbers. On quantum computers, when we produce quantum entanglement and perform quantum teleportation, we're actually doing it. We're doing quantum teleportation. We're not computing it. It's an actual physical event. And that means that to the extent that this ER equals EPR hypothesis applies, you're actually seeing the dynamics of the wormhole in a little bit of emergent space, not the real space of the laboratory, but the quantum entanglement is actually creating something that looks like the space of the traversable wormhole, which is, of course, is exactly what we're interested in. So this is my excitement for the coming years, because we know quantum computers now are going to get much better. They're going to get orders of magnitude better than they are now, I hope, relatively quickly. And if you apply that to what I'm just talking about here, that means we're going to be able to do more and more sophisticated wormhole experiments, I would hope, in the near future. Uh, we did a projection here based on, on Google's noise model that if you could reduce the amount of noise just by a factor of two, uh, our wormhole signal will get 10 times better. So I would hope that pretty quickly over the next few years, you'll be able to do much more ambitious experiments of this type. And so instead of the smallest, crummiest wormhole in the world, you'll be using more respectable wormholes that you can look at in more detail. And what do we want to know? Well, we'd like to look at all kinds of properties of wormholes. Wormholes are pretty interesting. But again, we'd also like to look at this connection between the wormholes and the emergent space and, and, and what quantum entanglement is telling us about the fabric of space. And that really, to me, is the exciting thing about this, that I think now we have an experimental handle, at least over time, over the next uh, 10, 20 years, where we'll be able to get some real experimental ha handle on what is the connection between quantum entanglement and actual fabric of space itself. So that's it. Uh, you survived now your trip through the wormhole. I hope most of you have survived your trip through the wormhole. Um, my closing thought was just that, uh, at the very least, the experiment I showed you is a new kind of quantum teleportation. It's not the same as the kind we've been doing here at Fermilab in the laboratory. And so another thing you might think about is, well, I don't care about quantum gravity. I don't care about wormholes, but I do care about quantum teleportation and the quantum internet. So maybe the thing that we're doing here actually has some practical advantages. And that's another direction you can go with the wormhole. And that's it. I'm going to thank you very much for your patience. And I'm